Okay, welcome back to our recorded lectures for HI-121. This is Land of the Amazons, the Horsewomen of the Ancient Steppe. All right, welcome to Scythia. So the Scythians were the prototypical horse nomads in Greek eyes. This is sort of an umbrella term that often gets used by the Greeks uh, for a region full of various nomadic groups, most of whom would have had their own names, but we don't know them, of course. Uh, the modern term Scythian is somewhat more restrictive. It's based on ethnography, geography, and linguistic evidence. But in general, it still refers to the people who practiced a specific sort of horse nomad culture in the region. So the region is basically from the Black Sea to Central Asia, uh, along with associated cultural practices of burial, art, and gender relations. The thing that freaked the Greeks out about them was the whole gender relations part. Now, nomadic groups do not have, uh, in many cases, a sharp division between male and female roles. This is for practicality's sake. To support this type of lifestyle, you cannot afford to sideline half your population. Women needed to be able to ride, hunt, even defend the tribe if they were attacked. Now, were there women warriors? Even without the benefit of archaeology, uh, my guess solely on the basis of what we know of their history and culture was yes. I mean, there's room within the social structure for this. And certainly we do see later examples of nomadic women taking on such roles. We do have archaeological evidence, of course, and we'll get into that shortly. But it's the Greeks that exaggerate this into the myth about the Amazons, because they're both fascinated and repelled by the idea, which makes it very sensationalistic. Now, the Scythians left no written history. Uh, we need to garner information about them from oral accounts, from art, archaeology. Uh, we know they raided uh, by the 7th century BCE, well into the Middle East. The Greeks came into contact with them when they started setting up colonies on the Aegean coast of Anatolia. So likely there was not just military contact, but also uh, trade, cultural exchange. All right, I don't want to dwell on the mythological aspects of the Amazons. Uh, suffice to say, they are a rather sensational uh, topic. Again, uh, the idea of warrior women don't, doesn't sit well with the Greeks, but it also fascinates them. There are scholars of classical mythology who argue that the defeat of the Amazons, or specific Amazons, in mythology is meant to represent men bringing women back into control or back into their proper place. But it is worth recognizing that historians in the classical period do see Amazons as real, not just as myths. And they identify them specifically with the Scythians. So Herodotus in the 5th century BCE says that some of the Amazons came together with Scythian men from another region, and they relocated. They formed the Sarmatians, which was another important nomadic group. Isocrates in the 4th century BCE uh, says that the Scythians led by the Amazons were one of the greatest enemies of Athens, that they had invaded Athens in its earlier history. <laughs> no, we don't have any idea what he thought he was talking about. Diodorus of Sicily uh, in the first century BCE, he created a whole history of the Amazons of Scythia based on other ethnographic sources. And he claimed that one great queen founded the Miscara, that she taught girls how to fight alongside boys, was apparently calling herself the daughter of Ares. Now, the interesting thing is that it's actually totally plausible that a female commander might have led a group of Scythians at some point. But what Diodorus does is he twists it into a, model, a moral tale. Basically what happens is that the women get above themselves. The queen creates a gynocracy, she makes women dominant and she forces men to take up domestic duties, uh, and she does so by maiming their legs. She is followed by many successors until one queen, Hippolyta, uh, is killed by Heracles and Theseus kidnaps another as his wife. The Amazons attack Greece, but are attacked at home by their neighbors and scattered. Now he sees this as real tales from history. He claims that after they lost their original homeland, they went back to the Scythians and were absorbed. Now, Strabo, again, <laughs> we keep coming back to Strabo. It's interesting how useful he is. Uh, he puts the uh, Scythians in the Caucasus, 
but he has a more realistic view of their lifestyle. He simply says that women have more freedom to hunt and to campaign with men. Now, probably the wildest is Pompeius Trogus from the first century CE. Uh, he wrote about the Celts, uh, first of all. His work on the Celts was lost, but we know it was summarized by another writer in the next century. Uh, now, he claimed that Scythian men and women were equals, but when he were, men were off at war for 15 years, the Scythian women threatened them. They said, come home or we will have sex with the neighbors and repopulate the tribe that way. Now, they did come home hearing that in one version of the story, but in another, he tells a story about Scythian widows who defend their clan's territories and refuse to marry because they say it's slavery. They create a whole new state without men. They even killed the husbands who had survived by staying at home and did have sex with the neighbors to procreate, but killed boys and raised girls. So we see fragmentary parts of this origin story elsewhere as well. Uh, safe to say it's a major challenge to Greek cultural norms. Uh, Roman writers tend to elaborate on the work of the Greek historians. They try to place the Amazons in space and time. They are somewhat more admiring of the Amazons' supposed achievements, and they particularly praise their queens for their heroism. Okay, so many tombs of Scythians and related tribes have been excavated. And we have benefited from modern osteology, which is the study of skeletons, uh, because it can do a much better job of determining the sex of skeletons. Uh, it's not infallible, but it's just much more accurate. And what it's told us is that a number of the warriors in these tombs were likely women. Uh, so these tombs are found between the Danube and the Don rivers. We have uh, 112 graves of likely uh, women warriors from the 5th and the 4th centuries BCE. Most appear to be between 60 and 30 years, 16 and 30 years old. Uh, further east, between the Don and the Caspian Sea, um, 40 more uh, potential female warrior burials. North of that, about 20% of burials from that period that have uh, military material associated with them appear to be female even more from the Ukraine. Now, so these women warriors or women associated with military goods at the very least um, are most common around the Northern Black Sea, which is the area that's associated most closely with the Amazons by the Greek writers. Now, the graves tend to contain full sets of weapons and horse trappings. Now, the problem with identifying women in these graves prior to the development of modern osteology is that archaeologists in the past tended to interpret any grave with weapons in it as male. So, you know, adhering to what they supposed were proper gender roles. Uh, many of these graves were first identified as male and then discovered to be otherwise. Some of these female skeletons show obvious signs of war wounds, which does tend to support the idea that the weapons were theirs and not just placed in their grave for symbolic protection in the afterlife. I mean, really, why are some archaeologists so desperate to explain away the potential existence of female warriors? I mean, some of the wounds include injuries that might have been inflicted by pointed axes of a type that was use, in use in the period. There are clear stab wounds and projectile punctures. Forensically, you can even interpret how some of these wounds were received. I mean, the head wounds from battle axes seem to have come from face-to-face -face combat. Uh, there are a lot of fractures of left arms, and that's consistent with trying to ward off a blow. I'm going to give you a few examples of some of these burials, um, just to give you a sense of how fascinating they are. You don't need to note down these details. Um, I'm just going to uh, give, you, give you a brief uh, look, as I said. So two 4th century BC tombs in Thrace hold silver armor, pottery cups, and arrowheads, as well as weapons and horses, uh, and a range of other precious goods. Uh, the various skeletons buried there were first identified as chieftains and their wives. But in 2010, a reanalysis of the skeletons revealed that they were all female. Uh, so potentially warrior women buried with their weapons and horses. There were less rich graves as well. There's one from the 6th century BC on the Dnieper River. Uh, it contained uh, a woman with a bracelet of fox teeth and gold earrings, 
She had a quiver and nearly a hundred arrows with her, as well as an iron spear spearhead. She was also buried with a child, which was interesting. Uh, some female warriors had large quantities of weapons. Uh, one from the 4th century in the Ukraine had two iron lance heads, a quiver with 47 arrows, two knives, so pebbles that were probably used to be meant to be used in a sling. Uh, a young man, man was buried at her feet with two bells and an iron bracelet, possibly some type of servant. Uh, oftentimes the women warriors are buried with children, like the, the one I mentioned, which is interesting. Uh, there's one really interesting burial in the Ukraine. It contains three young girls who appear to be between 10 and 15, but they all have scale armor. Uh, javelins, spears, and shields, plus arrows. It's the kind of equipment you would expect for people who are being trained as heavy cavalry. Now, Greek goods often show up in high-status burials, which is indicative of the trade that went on. Uh, there is a range of other grave goods uh, as well. Uh, not all were military. There were tools, there were decorative objects, uh, even feminine objects like combs and jewelry. Possibly the most famous is the uh, Isik burial from Kazakhstan. It was discovered in 1969. It was from somewhere between the 5th and the 3rd centuries BCE. It was hard to pin it down. The skull was crushed, but the skeleton appeared to be about 18 years old. So it was buried with scale armor, 2,000 gold decorative plaques, gold-plated boots, a decorative headset, headdress, a dagger and a long sword, plus beads and earrings. Uh, a variety of other rich goods, and a bowl with mystery script. And it was actually called the Golden Man of Isik, first of all. But one scholar in 1997 suggested that it was a woman. Uh, some of the goods were feminine in nature, and the dead person was only 5'3". And there were aspects about the bones that were suggestive that it was a female skeleton. But the bones have been lost, and uh, uh, now we can't prove it. Now, in 2010, there was another similar burial found, which was just simply called the Golden Warrior. First of all, it was deemed male, but now there are questions. I could go on for quite some time. I think you see some of the general principles here. Many of these graves have been conclusively determined to be that of women, but there is still a tendency to interpret wealthy warrior graves as men, which should probably be resisted while more testing is being done. Now, I want to look at the potential reflection of reality in a couple of the more sensationalistic ways Amazons are portrayed in Greek culture. So Amazon women, according to Greek myth, uh, were single-breasted. Uh, they supposedly removed one breast to allow them to shoot a bow and throw javelins, which is absolutely ridiculous, of course, because if they were nomads, they were using recurve bows. So that is not any threat to one's breasts. They're used held out in front of the body. But the idea was picked up by Greek historians because some authors suggested that Amazon meant breastless, so amastos, uh, without breasts. This is what we call folk etymology. So they made up various scenarios about self-mutilation in order to fit the folk etymology. But think of it like a meme. I mean, most of the writers who would come along to talk about the Amazons after Herodotus would pick up on the meme. Now, weirdly, Greek art does tend to show the Amazons as double-breasted, but often with one breast bared. Now, is this some type of symbol for the removed breast? It's, it's hard to tell. Or it might simply be a way to demonstrate that the attacker was female. Uh, Artemis and Atalanta, who are mythical figures who are not Amazons, are often depicted with one breast bared. Greek art in general tends to show the dominant shoulder of active figures unclothed. Now, there might have been some type of inspiration for this amongst nomadic horsewomen. Now, as archers and riders, they w would have had to, you know, contain jiggling somehow. So perhaps they were wearing leather vests or corsets. Uh, this tradition is a reality in the region, and it survived for centuries. It was remarked upon by later writers. Some of the uh, oral literature of the region also suggests that women used clothing to support or restrain their breasts for riding purposes. Possibly they might also have worn heavier armor on one side of the body, hence, you know, asymmetrical looking. So what about tattoos? Thracian women are often depicted as having been heavily tattooed in Greek art, and by the mid-6th century, Greek painters 
are depicting Amazons as a cross between Thracians and Scythians. They were probably intermingling anyways, the Thracians and Scythians. Their cultures are very similar. Armed women tend to be depicted with uh, geometric or animal patterns. Now, is it on their skin or is it on their clothing? It's kind of hard to tell. Uh, what we can say, however, is that the Greeks saw tattoos as signs of barbarity. Uh, they connected tattoos with people they saw as primitive, usually step people. But it may also have been a real practice amongst the nomads of the steppes. Uh, further into Central Asia, uh, some of the ice mummies discovered in the region uh, have also been extensively tattooed, uh, specifically the Altai ice mummies that were preserved in permafrost. You know, tattoos may have had special meaning in oral cultures in particular. So again, this comes back to exaggeration. The Amazon myth is all about drama, but that doesn't mean the drama didn't have some connection to the reality of the women who inspired it. Okay, pants. Most of the Amazons depicted on Greek vases are shown wearing trousers. Greeks didn't like trousers. They saw trousers as profoundly barbaric. In fact, trousers are a prime symbol that you're dealing with people who are barbarians. People who wore trousers were usually horse people in colder climates. They often had a significantly higher level of gender equality than the Greeks, and men and women would dress similarly. So pants were transgressive. Nomadic people also tended to use different colors and textures that the Greeks found offensive uh, from an aesthetic viewpoint. Now, I should also note that trousers offer a greater degree of control over visual and sexual access to a woman's body. And Greek men didn't approve of women, women having that level of control. But Scythian trousers are depicted by the Greeks as almost effeminate because there was this belief that the Amazon women had in, invented them in the first place. But what's weird is that the vase paintings display them in great detail as if the artists were fascinated by them. Remember what I said about them being both fascinated and repelled? Uh, the first Amazon women wearing trousers were depicted in the sixth century in Greek art. Oftentimes their clothing was highly ornate, obviously had some decorative patterns. We see that image there. Um, we see animal, um, geometric designs, many different colors. So it's their version of barbarian fashion, basically. But archaeology tells us that Scythian horsewomen did in fact dress similarly. We have found remains of their trousers. Also uh, similar examples of footwear and headwear to the depictions on vases. So this suggests that the Greeks did have some direct knowledge of these horsewomen, which just makes this all so much more interesting, if you ask me. This topic is a great example of how much archaeology can illuminate certain concepts that have become embedded in our understanding of the past. Okay, so <coughs> the various cultures in this region were oral uh, until well into the medieval period in most cases. I mean, even Armenian doesn't get an alphabet until the fifth century. And the oral culture has preserved many stories of female warriors. You're gonna read some of them uh, for the Zoom session. Some of them may have been influences on Greek concepts of Amazons. Uh, some scholars who've worked on mythology in particular suggest that some of these oral stories affected the Greek myths about women warriors. Now, in the Caucasus, as well as further into Central Asia and Asia, we have much more than archaeology to support that these women were part of their cultures. We have oral tales, some of them mythical, others with some root in truth. Now, they're very different than Greek Amazons. They fight alongside men. They often win their battles, as opposed to Amazons, who usually lose tragically. So one example is Amazon of Circassia. She's a warrior queen from the Nart sagas. Uh, the Narts were people from the Caucasian steppes and mountains. And uh, her saga depicts women fighting alongside the men whenever they were needed. They loved men, but they would cut out a man's heart if he was an enemy. Her story is a bit tragic. She accidentally kills the man she loves while their tribes are fighting and then kills herself. And their mingled blood causes a magical spring to appear that heals broken hearts and uh, renews strength. It's a weird echo of Achilles and Penthesilea, 
uh, if you know that story from Greek myth, Achilles kills her, and as she's dying, realizes he's fallen in love as he looks into her eyes. Now, the gender reversal would have been odd to the Greeks, and honestly, I like the other version of the story better. Now, another example is the English horse maiden. So in this story, a girl has seven brothers. They are all killed. She goes out for vengeance. She finds a sick horse that she nurses back to health, and then uses it to attack the people who killed her brothers. She kills the whole tribe, steals their horses, and gives them to her friend who helped her nurse her horse back to health. Now he asks her to marry him, but she refuses because she says, you know, you went along with all of this and yeah, you helped me, but you assumed I was a boy. She was in disguise as a boy. So I don't know why she, you know, held that against him, but she did. Uh, Turgatau of Maeotia is mentioned in a 2nd century CE work, but was from much earlier. Uh, she was a warrior queen in the Black Sea area who was given in marriage to one of the local kings. He gets tired of her, wants to marry uh, a new ally's daughter, so he imprisons her. Uh, she goes home, takes over her tribe. Uh, she escapes, rather, goes home, takes over her tribe. Uh, then she makes new allies and attacks her ex and his new friend. Go, girl. <laughs> Homage of the Sarmatians is from the 2nd century BC. She supposedly becomes leader of her tribe when her husband became a drunk. And she helped establish peace in her area by beating up on a Scythian tribe, which was behaving badly. Now, there are tons of these stories from this region. The Greeks didn't own the Amazon concept. And frankly, the non-Greek stories are, are much less full of creepy misogyny, which I do appreciate. There's much more material of this type from Central Asia, but uh, given that uh, these tribes there often remained connected to their oral cultures, uh, many of these sources aren't recorded anywhere until the mid-20th century. So they're very far removed from any potential ancient source. Uh, but similar to the Caucasus stories, oftentimes the story ended well for the Amazon. She didn't end up dying at the hands of a male hero. Now, this sort of theme is reproduced even in traditional games in Central Asia. Uh, Keshkumai, which is still played by nomadic groups in the region, is an example. So this is how it's played. A young man on horseback chases a young woman on horseback while racing. If he fails to catch up with her, but doesn't fall off his horse, she gets to beat him with her whip. If he succeeds in catching up with her, she gets a kiss. But here's the thing, she's, he's not going to succeed in catching up with her unless she lets him. I mean, kissing someone when you're both riding at a gallop requires cooperation. Right? Now, women and men in nomadic cultures do tend to compete in games against each other. They have wrestling matches on horseback. They have archery games. The World Nomad Games uh, is a good example uh, where you can see this happening. Uh, this is a connection to stories where a groom in these cultures would have to prove his worth by competing against his would-be bride. And certainly we see other examples of this even much later in history. There's the, uh, the Mongol princess Kurlun, who says, you know, I'll marry the first man that beats me in a wrestling match. And then hundreds of men try it. And none of them beat her. There's this real sense of equality here, which I, I quite like. And again, it's a realistic sense of equality because the culture demands it. You cannot maintain this type of lifestyle with only half of your population contributing. So what can we take away from these last two lectures? Basically, we need to be cautious about assuming anything regarding the gender roles of women in ancient society. Just because the Greeks were super weird about women uh, does not mean that other societies, even supposedly barbarian societies, didn't have a more equitable approach. That being said, it's unlikely that any of these societies had complete gender equality. Women still had to be capable of doing what they wanted to do. And, you know, there are physical challenges here. But I think with the ability to identify skeletons and their sex much more easily, it raises some interesting possibilities for archaeology in these regions. There's much work left to be done, but uh, in terms of the Amazons, we're going to know more about the people who inspired them as time goes on.
Okay, so that will wrap us up for this week. Thanks very much, guys. I shall see you on Tuesday.